What is up? What is up? What is up? Make some noise. How y'all feeling tonight? Y'all feeling good? Man, I'm so pumped to be here with you guys. Um, it is an honor for those of y'all who don't know me. My name is Joey McLaughlin, and um, I get the honor of serving on staff here. And I'm so pumped to be able to hang out here tonight with you students. It just feels good for me to be on this stage with you guys. It's going to be a super fun night. Hey, turn to your neighbor real quick and say, are you ready? Turn back to him and say, for what? Say, for that word. Say, you ain't ready. Hey, so um, let me ask you this question. I want to start out by asking you this question. Have you ever been controlled by something? Yeah. Like you ever been controlled by something? Like anybody ever been controlled by hunger? Like you were so hungry that like you would eat a cow right now? Like you're so hungry, like you would eat your like little sibling, like just so hungry you were controlled by it. Anybody ever been controlled by the need to go to the bathroom? You feel that? Like you got to go potty so bad, so bad, like. Maybe on a road trip, you're just controlled by your need to go to the bathroom and you're like doing that like potty dance because you don't want to go in your pants, right? And so you finally get out and you like run to the bathroom of like a KFC and on the way there, you see this old dude push him down, break his hip because you just like, you're controlled by the need to go to the bathroom. You feel me? Like controlled by the need to go to the bathroom. Anybody ever been controlled by like a girl? Any fellas? Like she just like, like got you and you're just like controlled. You do anything she tell you to do you should see a counselor, okay? Like, that's a problem, because you're like eight. <laughs> Anybody ever been controlled by a song? What about a song? Like, a song comes on, and you just can't not dance? Like, walk the moon, shut up and dance. Every time that song comes on, I'm just like, Ugh. Like, just controlled by it, can't help myself. What about this? You ever been controlled by fear? Anybody ever been controlled by fear? Like you were so afraid of something that you were just like controlled by that fear. Hey, let me tell you about a time that I was controlled by fear. So how many of you have ever hiked Kennesaw Mountain before? Any ever hiked Kennesaw Mountain? Okay. Um, I grew up over on that side of town, over in K-Town. Um, any of our seniors going to Kennesaw State next year? Any seniors going to Kennesaw State? All right, one of you. Nice. The thing I love about Kennesaw State, hey, y'all listen up. Kennesaw State, they've got the dopest mascot ever. It's an owl. Like, how awesome is that? Woo! 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 Like, just truly terrifying on the football field, right? An owl. I love that thing. So, Kennesaw State. Um, so, I grew up over on that side of town, and um, I grew up all of the time going to hike Kennesaw Mountain. I used to run on Kennesaw Mountain. used to take some honeys up to the top of Kennesaw Mountain for some hikes, because I'm a romantic. You know what I do, baby boo. Okay, all right. So, so that's Kennesaw Mountain, right? And I used to do it like all the time. And I'll never forget, check it out, check it out. I was 17 years old and I went for a run up Kennesaw Mountain. And if you've ever been on a run for, uh, on Kennesaw Mountain before, if you've ever hiked this thing, then you know that it kind of weaves in and out of residential areas as well as kind of like the woodsy, foresty parts. And so I was going on this run, I was 17 years old and I was kind of in between the residential parts and in between like the woodsy, foresty parts, okay? When I see this bike that's kind of buried back in the woods and it's this like old school vintage looking bike, there are these tree branches and leaves that are kind of covering it, but it just looks dope. And so I go over and I pull this bike out and it's like powder blue, it looks like it's like from the 1920s. I'm like, did this thing get left in the Civil War? Like, I know that that's not the time of the Civil War, but like, that's where my mind was, okay? And so I'm like, what? Like, this thing is so cool. Like, it must have been here for like a hundred years. And so I look around to see like, is this bike anybody's? And I don't see anybody. So I'm like, I guess it's a gift from above. Thank you, Jesus. Bless up, right? And so I hop on this bike thinking like, oh man, like it's my day. And I start to ride this bike, right? And as soon as I do, I hear this man yell, hey, hey, get off my bike. And I'm like, your bike, Jesus gave me this bike. And I just keep on pedaling, right? Um, and so he, he just starts yelling louder, hey, 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 get off my bike. And I mean, the smart thing to do then would have been to like get off his bike, but I don't, I just keep on riding. And he goes, hey, this is your final warning. Get off my bike. And I'm like, chug up the deuces, I'm riding, okay? <laughs> and so he said, I'm not playing games with you. And then guys, no joke, the dude takes a gun and shoots it in the air. 
Now, here's what you've got to know about Kennesaw, okay? It is a law. This, like, you can look it up on the Googles. It is a law. You have to own a gun to live in the city of Kennesaw. Like, in order to live in the city and own a house, you've got to own a gun. And so the people who live here are, like, crazy. They're, like, backwoods, rednecks, sound like Stephen Gibbs, crazy, okay? Like, these... That's these people, they're just insane. And so this dude shoots a gun. And in that moment, like the logical thing to do, the smart thing to do, the wise thing to do would be to get off the bike, right? But I don't do smart things. I keep pedaling faster, okay, and faster. And so he is at this point chasing after me. This man is chasing after me, yelling, get off my bike, get off my bike, get off my bike, final warning. And he shoots his gun and it hits a tree that is like three feet from my face. And so at this point, I just like, I'm terrified, losing my mind. I drop the bike and I just start running as fast as I can. I'm like, that's not Jesus' bike, that's the devil's bike, okay? And so I start running and I'm running as fast as I can, but this guy's chasing after me. And like, I, I don't, I can't outrun a gun, right? And so I eventually come to a break in the trail where there's these like big rocks in this cave. And I go back and I'm like, I'm not gonna be able to outrun this guy. So my only option is to hide. And so I go around the corner and I go into this cave and I'm just like sitting there. And guys, I am like, terrified for my life because this guy is chasing after me with a gun. And so I'm like there in this cave and I'm like trying to be as quiet as I can, trying to calm my breath down because my heart is like racing and I'm sweating. And all I can think in this moment is like, man, I don't want to die. Like I'm 17 years old. I, don't, I haven't had a kid yet. I haven't gotten married yet. I'm like, geez, I'm supposed to make it to the honeymoon, right? And so I'm just like terrified sitting in this cave. And, and you know that moment where you're like hiding and you don't want somebody to find you. And then you start to hear their footsteps. And with every step he takes, I just feel myself becoming gripped by fear, controlled by fear. Like I'm not, I'm about to lose my mind. Like a little baby terrified and just step by step by step, I hear leaves crack and I hear just his breath and he's just coming. And sure enough, he comes around the edge of the cave and I'm sitting there just in all the fear that I can. And as soon as he comes around the cave, he's got his gun drawn. He points it right at me. And then I wake up from my dream. It was all a dream. That story doesn't happen. You're crazy. There's no way that that could happen. But how many of you have had a dream like that before? How many have had a dream like that before where it felt so real? Like I woke up from that dream and I was like in a panic and I was in sweats and I didn't know what to do because dreams have a way of controlling us. Come with me on this. What if we were as controlled by the love of Jesus as we are controlled by our dreams? What if the love of Jesus gripped us as intensely, held us as tightly, and motivated us as deeply as our dreams do? What if that was so real to us? The love of Jesus was so real to us. Look right at me, students. That it grabbed a hold of us and it controlled our lives. It was the realest thing to us. This was the reality for the early church. Check it out. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at what Paul says. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So it says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. Now, let me unpack that for you. Look right at me. Hey, all eyes on me. That idea of the fear of the Lord, what I don't want for you to think that that means is therefore knowing that we're afraid of God. That idea of the fear of the Lord, it would be this understanding of this awestruckness of God, standing in amazement at God, standing in wonder of God because of how big he is. So therefore, knowing how great God is, knowing how mighty God is, knowing how beautiful God is, knowing that God is enough, knowing that God is the only one who is to be worshiped, but it's, it's also got this other idea. Knowing that the Lord is the only person who will judge the living and the dead. Knowing that one day you and I and all of humanity will stand before the God of the universe and have to give an account for the things that we've done. Think about that in your mind for a second, knowing that one day, all of this, all that you can see and taste and experience, all that you can feel, all that you can hear, all that you can know is going to be gone. 
This world is going to be gone. Your life is going to be gone. Your cars, your clothes, your houses, your careers, your Instagram feeds, your sports teams are going to be gone. And you're going to stand before the God of the universe who created all of this. And you're going to have to give an account for what you've done. Knowing that fear of the Lord, the early church says, we persuade others. Notice that the Bible calls Christians, look right at me, to not be passive, but to be persuasive. Not to sit back and hope that this world changes. Not to sit back and hope that somebody tells somebody about Jesus. Not to sit back and hope that things get better. Not to sit back and hope that good happens to other people. Not to sit back and hope that somebody else solves a problem. Not to sit back and hope that our parents do something or our teachers do something. But to step up and to persuade others. Why? Because the love of Christ controls us? What if the gospel gripped us in such a way that it governed our lives? What if the love of Jesus became so real to us, so tangible to us? What if it sank its teeth into us in a way that it dictated and determined every step that we took? Like, I want for you to imagine being controlled by a dream or by fear, by love or by the need to go to the bathroom or by your hunger or whatever it may be, being controlled by your desire to get perfect grades or to get into the college of your choice or to impress that girl or to impress that guy or to fit in or to have people like you. What is the thing in your life that controls you right now? What if you were controlled by the love of Jesus that deeply? What if it like literally determined where you went and how you acted and what you said? The love of Jesus is big enough and strong enough and scandalous enough that this is the way that it should control us. Like we've seen, we see this happen with other loves, right? Like this is the way that it goes when you experience a love that is vivid and that is real and that is active and that is alive. It begins to control you. So like me, like I was just this normal high school guy until I met my wife, right? Just this normal high school guy, like, broing out with my homies, way too much Axe body spray, listening to Eminem and, like, Tupac in my bedroom. And then, like, the next day, like, I meet Kayla, and I'm, like, mesmerized by her. She grabs a hold of me, and then all of a sudden, I'm singing, like, Whitney Houston in my bedroom. I will always love you. Right? Like, that's... It just control, like what high school guy does that? None of them, okay? But when you get gripped by love, it controls you. It makes you different. Like I started showering, like all of a sudden. It was this beautiful thing because I was controlled by the love of Kayla. And this is the way that the love of Jesus should work in our lives. When we experience it, when we know it, when we taste it, when we feel it, it should control us, which leads me to believe that a lot of you, look right at me, don't really know the love of Jesus. Like, I just want to be real with you tonight. Like, you might not know the love of Jesus. You might not know that the love of Jesus is the only place on planet Earth where you're going to be able to find, like, true forgiveness. Like, real forgiveness. Not strings attached, conditional forgiveness, but, like, in all your flaws, in all of your insecurities, in all of your lies, forgiveness. The love of Jesus is the only place on planet earth where you're going to be able to find that kind of forgiveness. It's the only place on planet earth where you're going to be truly accepted, like for who you are, not for the fake Instagram version of yourself that you want everybody else to see, but for who you actually are when the makeup is washed off your face and when you can't hide and you can't pretend and you're just you. Jesus is the only place where you're going to be able to find true acceptance. It's the, he is the only place where you're going to be able to find true joy, like not that fake happiness where you got to wash your face and act like everything's okay and pull yourself up, but like legitimate, soul-satisfying joy. He's the only place. Like, I don't know what your life has looked like. I don't know what pain you have experienced, but man, I grew up and man, my dad walked out on me. He showed up to my sister's birth with another woman. My mom then got married and she went through five marriages, five of them. I had person after person after person walk out on me. 
So I've got this jacked up definition of what love is supposed to look like. And then I meet this person named Jesus who sticks closer than a brother, who never leaves me, who never forsakes me, who, who is there with me every step of the way. It is scandalous love, undeserving love, otherworldly love. And the crazy thing is, is it's love in the midst of my sin. Like I didn't ask for this love. I didn't initiate this love. I didn't go looking for this love. This love came looking for me. And when I spit in this love's face, when I turned my back on this love, when I did whatever I wanted to do, this love just hunted me down and hunted me down and hunted me down and hunted me down. This love makes me whole. This love gives me purpose. This love gives me strength. This love puts together all the broken pieces of my heart. And when you know a love like that, a love that's this real, this deep, not ethereal, not far out there, not far off, not an imaginary love, not a religious love, but a relational love where the God of the universe speaks to you and walks with you and knows you, it grabs a hold of you and it begins to control you to the point that you can't keep it to yourself. I want for you to think for a second, if you are a follower of Jesus who knows the love that I just talked about, about the reality that there are other people out there in the world who do not know this love. Can you think for a second about how desperate this world is? Think for a second about how desperate some of you are. Man, I think about, man, some of you in the crowd right now who can't even pay attention because you're so desperate for somebody to pay attention to you. That's desperation. That's wanting to fit in. That's just wanting somebody so bad to like you. That's what's happening right there. I want for you to think about how desperate our world is. I want for you to think about your friend that you know sticks her finger down her throat every night and throws up because she wants to feel skinny and pretty and beautiful. Think about how desperate our world is. I want for you to think about your friend who you know smokes weed in his closet by himself because he's desperate. I want for you to think about that person at your school. Maybe it's you who goes to party after party, who hooks up with person after person and gives themselves away just to try to feel something on the inside, to try to feel worthy on the inside. I want for you to think about the counseling appointments, the antidepressants. I want for you to think about your anxiety and your depression and your loneliness and your anger and your divorce and your rage and your thoughts of suicide that are in your mind. Think about how desperate our world is. Think about all the ways that they're just looking for love, searching for love, begging for love. And we know love, real love, destiny altering love soul shaping love and we're gonna keep it to ourselves how crazy is that that would be like having the cure for cancer i want for you to imagine this for a second i want for you to imagine that you discover the cure for cancer think about the billions of people who die from cancer think about the families that are ruined by cancer Think about the siblings who die, the friends who die, the moms who die, and you've got the cure. You figured it out. You can save all of humanity, and you're going to keep it to yourself. How sick do you have to be? That's outrageous. That's outlandish. That's illogical. But that's the exact same reality of when we keep the love of Jesus to ourselves. The love of Jesus, it changes everything, heals everything, fixes everything, completes everything for everyone. And we cannot keep it to ourselves. It's too good. It matters too much. But we make so many excuses about why we can't share the love of Jesus with other people. And when I'm talking about sharing the love of Jesus with other people, this is what I mean. I mean, it's having an intentional conversation with them about who Jesus is, telling them about the way that Jesus has changed you, telling them your story of the way that Jesus' love met you and made you a new person. I'm talking about inviting them to church. I'm talking about sharing the gospel with them, sharing the good news of what Jesus has done. We've got to do this. But we make so many excuses about why we can't, don't we? 
We think to ourselves, man, I just, I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to come across as a know-it-all. I don't want to offend anybody or, or, or we're afraid or uh, we care about our reputation. They might not like me. They might not be my friend anymore. Or I'm just taking the slow road. Like I'm going to p- p- play the friendship card. I'll be really nice to them. Hope that they notice that I'm a good person. And then maybe in the end, they'll ask me what's different about me. Let me just ask you, how's that working for you? Because when you've been friends with somebody for five years and they still haven't asked you what's different about you, there's two logical conclusions. Number one, your strategy isn't working. Or number two, there isn't anything that different about you. And so what's it gonna take? Like, what's it gonna take for these excuses to be swallowed up? All these excuses that we have. You know, the excuse that I hear most often is I just don't know enough. And and I think it's legitimate. You ever thought that before? Like I would talk to somebody about Jesus. I would share somebody about the love of Jesus and the cross of Christ and what he's accomplished on my behalf. But maybe I just don't know enough. Maybe they're gonna ask me a question and they're gonna stump me and I'm not gonna know what to say. And so if I knew more, then I would share more. You ever thought that? You ever had that pop into your mind? If I knew more, then I would share more. Well, what if the reality of the Bible is actually the reverse? What if it's actually opposite? Check it out, Philemon chapter one, verse uh, six Pray that the sharing of your faith, Paul says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. This is so good. You can't miss this. All eyes on the screen. Paul says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective. It may work for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. So this is what we think. We think if I knew more, if I had more knowledge, if I knew more answers, if I could answer more questions, if I had more information, if I took an apologetics class, if I uh, knew the Bible more, if I could preach or whatever it may be, if I had more knowledge, then I would share more of my faith. But Paul says it's actually the opposite is the way that it works, that if you would share your faith, then it would become effective for you to have the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. So you sharing your faith is actually what's going to trigger you knowing what Christianity is all about. This is so good. Like this changed my life. I'm just gonna be completely real with you. Some of you who like want passionate Christianity, you wanna make a difference for God. You wanna know what it's like to really go on this adventure of following Jesus. You wanna know that God is real and that God is alive and that God's spirit will work miracles in you and through you. You wanna see people's lives change. You wanna feel like you really know him and that this stuff really matters and that you're walking the walk, that you're running the race and fighting the faith. This is what you've gotta do. You've gotta stop waiting till you know more. You gotta step up and do it. And then you're gonna know the love of God. When you get active, when you get off of the sideline and in the game, when you start engaging in mission, talking to people, sharing with others about the love of Jesus, that's when you start to know the love of Jesus in a truly extraordinary way. It's not like, let me know more, then I'll share more. No, if you'll start to share, then you'll start to know. You want to know that God is in your corner. You want to know that God has your back. You want to know that God will come through for you. You want to see him show up in supernatural ways. Take a risk with your reputation. Take a risk with your friendship. Just literally lay it out on the line and go, hey, I know we've been friends and I know that we've never talked about this and I I don't know where you land on this, but I've just got to tell you about this extraordinary love of Jesus, about what he's done for me and for you and for everyone. I've I've just got to have you know and just watch how he shows up. Watch how he comes through. Watch how he gives you the words to say exactly when you need them. Watch how he blows your mind with his faithfulness. Like, have you ever wanted God to answer one of your prayers? Been like, man, I wish God would answer my prayers. Like, I'm praying and he's not answering them. I can never hear him. Like, I just want him to answer it one time. Like, God, if you would just answer me one time, and then I would know you're real, and then I would trust you. You ever felt like that? Let me give you a prayer that I promise you God will answer. Students, if you start to pray, Jesus, use my life to make your name famous. He will answer that prayer. 
every single time. God, open a door for me to have a gospel conversation with my friends. He will answer that prayer every single time. You'll be able to know God answering your prayers. You'll be able to know what it's like to see the Holy Spirit working in you and through you. You'll be able to know what it's like to see somebody cross from death into life. It's extraordinary. It's not no more than share more. It's you start sharing about this uncontrollable, uncontainable love, and then you will know who you are and what you were created for. There is a part of Christianity. Look right at me. I don't want you to miss this because I don't want you to start to believe a lie of what this Christian thing is all about and then wake up 10 years from now and feel like we sold you a lie. I don't want you to think, okay, like I get it. It's about sitting in chairs, listening to sermons, singing songs, lifting my hands in the air. That's this whole Christian thing. No, it's not. No, it's not. And if you follow that, you're going to wake up really disappointed 10 years from now. But if you will understand that when I get engaged, when I live on mission, when I make disciples, when I follow Jesus, when I live how he lived and I love people and can't keep his love to myself, that's when you experience the true joy of Jesus following. Never until you do that. Never until you do that will you experience the fullness of what Jesus died for you to experience. Students, this needs to become deeply emotional for us like deeply emotional. Like we, we cannot lose our grittiness. We cannot lose our willingness to be rejected. We cannot lose our, our boldness. Like you look at the early church and they're just marked by boldness, marked by boldness, marked by boldness. Now, I don't want for you to think that boldness is not being afraid. No, that's fearlessness. They were bold. They weren't fearless. In the face of fear, they move forward. In the face of judgment, in the face of losing friends, in the face of being rejected, in the face of being misunderstood, in the face of all of that, they continue to move forward in boldness. And we cannot lose that. And we cannot lose our understanding of how central prayer has to be to this. Like this doesn't just happen out of nowhere. It's not like, okay, I'll just get jacked up on Jesus juice and go out and do this. No, like you, you pray, you beg God to give you the boldness. You pray for one another. You come alongside each other. So like there's this story in the book of Acts, okay, where um, these guys are uh, Peter and uh, I can't even remember who's with them right now, but they're really bold before this council. Okay, super bold. They preach the gospel. They're going to throw them in prison and they've just got this crazy amount of boldness. And um, then you see later on in the book of Acts that the entire time that they were being bold, that the church was praying for them. That they're like, God, make those men bold. God, make those men bold. God, make those men bold. Paul himself, he says, I pray like I'm praying. And will you pray for me that I would be bold as I'm supposed to be? I mean, Jesus says, right, the harvest, look, look, check it out, Matthew chapter nine. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. It's coming up on the screen, I promise. Um, so pray to the Lord of the harvest, to, to the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. So he's saying that there's tons of people out there who need to hear about my love, tons of people out there who need to be rescued with my love, tons of people out there who need to encounter my love. And so pray, beg God to raise up laborers to go out in the harvest. And you are one of those laborers. You are one of those laborers. I want for you to think for just a second about what's gonna happen when you arrive on the shores of eternity. And I want for you to ask yourself the question, when you're walking around heaven, do you think that you are going to care about whether or not Someone was offended because you shared the love of Jesus with them. I want for you to think about when you are walking around heaven, make this as real for yourselves as you can right now. And you're looking for your best friend and you cannot find them there because they're in a different place called hell, a place of conscious, physical, literal, torment. I want for you to think about walking around heaven and looking for your brother and not being able to find them because they're not there. I want for you to think about the people who sit in your class. I want for you to think about the people who ride your bus, the people who play on your sports teams and who one day you're gonna wanna be in heaven with and know that it's possible that without you sharing the love of Jesus with them, that they're not going. 
Like when is the last time you wept for your lost friends? When is the last time that you were like broken for your parents who don't know Jesus? When is the last time that it moved you and gripped you and mattered to you? When is the last not time that you just stayed up late in your bedroom and you looked through your yearbook at all of your friends and all of the people who've signed your yearbook and all of the people who you've grown up with throughout your life and you've thought, I don't know if he knows. I don't know if she knows. I don't know where he's gonna be. I know that he had doubts. I know he was of a different faith. I know she had questions. I know she was angry. I know she was depressed. I know that he was far from God. I know that he partied all the time, but I don't know. I don't know if they're gonna be in heaven. I don't know if I'm going to see him again. I don't know if they're going to make it to the other side. When is the last time that the gospel had any level of urgency for us the way that it did for the early church who were willing to lay down their lives? We're concerned about laying down our reputations. They died for this. They bled for this. They lost their lives for this. They gave up their homes for this. They were marginalized and persecuted and you're worried about losing some Instagram followers? You're worried about whether or not you're gonna offend somebody? Think about it. If they're in hell, do you think that they're gonna be in hell and they're just gonna be like, man, I'm so glad they didn't offend me. Real pumped that they didn't offend me. Real pumped that they didn't judge me. No, I, I'm pretty sure that there's gonna be a day when I get to heaven and I'm praying this, that somebody's gonna walk up to me and go, hey, Jesus saved me, but bro, you told me and I wouldn't be here otherwise. Is anybody gonna say that to you? In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said this, go into all of the world and tell the gospel to all creation. That's a command, that's not a suggestion. Go into all of the world and tell the gospel to all creation. And that wasn't just said to Jesus' disciples, that was said to all of his followers. If you wanna follow Jesus, sharing the gospel, making disciples is not an option. It's a command. It is not for pastors or professionals. It's for all people who call on the name of Jesus. Every single one of us. And I want for you to know that Jesus's love language is obedience. Jesus's love language is obedience. The way that we show that we love Jesus is we obey him. We do what he's told us to do. We follow in his footsteps. We proclaim this gospel at all costs. It costs him his life. And it might cost you something too. For 2000 years, this movement called Christianity has been built on the backs of everyday ordinary people many of whom were teenagers, teenagers. The disciples, they were teenagers. Mary and Joseph, teenagers. David, a teenager. These were teenagers who moved the kingdom of God forward. Just everyday, ordinary people. They had stresses, they had challenges they moved the gospel forward because they got so gripped by this intoxicating, this consuming, this beautiful love of Jesus that they could not keep it to themselves. And so for 2000 years, everyday people, just like you, and just like you, and just like you, and just like you, and just like you, have encountered the cross, have encountered Jesus, have encountered the Holy Spirit in such a way that they said, I'm going forward. I'm gonna tell anybody and everybody that I come in contact with about the love of Jesus. I, my life is no longer my own. My dreams, they don't matter. My reputation, it doesn't matter. What people think of me doesn't matter. There's one thing that matters and it's the love of Jesus getting in the hearts of as many people as humanly possible because heaven and hell are real and people are going there. And so what's it gonna take for us Students, it's your turn. The time is now. I am tired of spectator Christianity. I am tired of people just sitting in the seats and doing nothing with their faith. That is not salvation. That's not the gospel. The gospel grabs a hold of people. The love of Jesus gets so deep into people that it sends them on this trajectory of laying down their lives for the glory of Jesus' name. 
And so I want to ask you this question, who's your one? Who's your one? Who is the one person in your mind right now as I've been talking tonight that you're like, I don't know if they know. I don't know if I'm going to see them on the other side. I don't know if they know about the love of Jesus. I don't know if they know that they could be adopted and freed, that they could be a child of God, that they could be a part of something bigger than themselves, that they could be accepted, that they could experience grace and forgiveness and freedom and healing. I don't know if they know. I don't know if they know that 2,000 years ago, this man named Jesus died on a cross. He was brutally murdered. Blood, tears, pain rained down so that that doesn't have to happen to us. I don't know if they don't know. I don't know if they know that their price has been paid, that somebody stood in their place, that new life is available. I don't know if they know that Jesus rose from the dead and offers new life. I don't know if they know that they can be certain of eternal life in a place called heaven. I don't know if they know. Who's your one? Is it your mom? Who's of a different religion? Is it your dad? who walked out on you? Is it your best friend? Is it, is it your neighbor? Is it your cousin? Is it somebody in your team sports class? Is it your teacher? Who is it for you? What's gonna happen is the band's gonna come out and we're gonna sing one last song tonight and there are going to be buckets of white ping pong balls on the front of this stage. And what I wanna have happen is when that song is happening, with every head bowed and every eye closed right now, I want for you to think about who your one person is that you know you need to have a gospel conversation with. Who is that one person that you need to intentionally engage with the story of Jesus? Not somebody who you need to wait on and hope an opportunity presents itself, but the person who you need to go to, to move towards, to hunt down and to do whatever it takes to talk about the scandalous love of Jesus with. Who's your one? Then what I wanna have happen is during this next song, when you know who that is, I want for you to make your way to the front. And I want for you to grab one of these white ping pong balls and I want for you to write that person's name on it. And then I want for you to drop it in this go and tell wall saying, I'm gonna be obedient to Jesus's commands in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, to go into all the world and tell the gospel to all creation. And then what we're going to do as a church is we're going to commit to praying for every one of those white ping pong balls until that gospel conversation happens. And then students, when you have that gospel conversation, you're going to come back to Stone Creek and you're going to grab an orange ping pong ball and you're going to write their name on an orange ping pong ball. And you're going to drop that in the go and tell wall. And it's going to serve as a sign and a statement that you are obedient to tell your friend, your family member, your neighbor about the scandalous love of Jesus. And we're going to celebrate. We're going to lose our minds. Heaven's going to go crazy because you are obedient to move the message of Jesus forward. And so God, I just pray for radical boldness. I pray for crazy boldness. I pray for crazy bravery. I pray that tonight these students would get a picture, a vision of your love that's so real, so big, so consuming that it controls them, that it holds them hostage and that it motivates them to tell their friends and their family members. I pray tomorrow at school, somebody stands on a lunch table and just starts telling about the love of Jesus. I pray that tomorrow before a sports practice that they shut the thing down and they go, I got to tell you, you got to know about the love of Jesus. I pray miraculous things happen because we get so controlled by your love. And I ask it in your beautiful name. And all God's people said, amen.